So this talk forms a part of the Interspecies Conversations lecture series. So this lecture series is an online and regular workshop series that gives the opportunity to researchers and scientists and professors from the field of animal communication um, the chance to kind of present their work and then have a discussion around the work that they've been developing. So we're really interested as interspecies internet to advance and accelerate this understanding of the different forms and diversities of communication between species. So if anyone does have any thoughts on great presentations, which would form part of this series, you're welcome to contact us. And I hope through this way, we can bring some new discoveries and new uh, research to the forefront. So today, that's what we're going to be doing. So I'm very pleased that Elenia is here to give us a talk about uh, building the dog internet. So she's a lecturer at the University of Glasgow, and she'll discuss her work around speculating on the dog to dog internet and researching on building a dog to human video caller. So before we start, I'll just ask that everybody keeps your mic off during the lecture so that uh, we can hear the full presentation clearly. And then any questions that you have, you can put them into the chat or you can also, of course, ask them at the end um, just by raising your hand and uh, we'll get through those in a moderated fashion. So yeah, I think that's, that's where we need to start. So I pass over the mic and then I'll speak to you all after when we do our moderated discussion. Let's go over to our presentation. Hi, and so thank you for that lovely introduction. And I'm super excited here um, to be today to talk about my research area and all the stuff I've been working on. Um, so I thought I would start like um, a bit just by introducing myself, like uh, Kate mentioned, you know, I'm a new lecturer at the University of Glasgow. Um, before this, I did my postdoc in Finland, um, in Alto in Helsinki. Um, I also worked with the zoo there and did like various other things, but originally I did do uh, my PhD and a lot of my work was focused on how do we build these sort of dog technology. And so how do we develop screen devices for dogs. Um, I really got into this sort of work uh, a little bit by accident, I was doing my master's degree on computer science and um, I got my lovely black Labrador who you can see here who's traveled just around with me called Zach. Um, and I noticed that he would be watching TV and I was building computer products at the time. And so I thought it would be really fun to sort of combine these two things together. And this is really sort of how I really got into developing dog tech and into this sort of um, world of everything together. So I thought today's talk would be like about 25, 30 minutes long, leaving time for questions. And I've sort of structured it into like these three parts. So just to begin in sort of what is like the animal computer and dog computer interaction fields all together, um, going into my work where I develop screen devices for dogs, and then at last going into this sort of dog internet. So the research field that I tend to uh, build in with is called animal computer interaction. And what this is, you can call like ACI for short, um, it in large looks at how animals can use and interact with computers. Um, and this is largely the sort of the same study that we do in humans already, where we look at how we can build interactive computer devices for them. But I would say it's actually on a larger scale. So we can look at cows, for instance, or goats or dogs, as I look at we're going to talk about today, or monkeys. Um, but all of this sort of involves animals and how we can design and build interactive computers for them in some form. And so this research inherently is situated really at sort of the intersection of computer science, behavioral science, design and media studies, and sort of all these several different fields. And so in many ways, it's very highly interdisciplinary. But in essence, when I talk about animal computer interaction or dog computer interaction, what I'm talking about is how we can build computers that really look at how animals interact with the world, then build computers around this sort of everyday interactions how we can sort of iteratively design computers with animals. And in some ways, this helps us uncover really what we know about animals. And so I'm gonna go over a few examples in this talk just to really highlight this out a bit more. Um, but what I just wanted to highlight here is really that no matter what animals we sort of design and build technologies for, um, we use sort of very similar methods actually across this. And a lot of learning can be taken across various different animals. 
but today I'm just going to be talking a lot about dog computer interaction. And in my view, um, dog computer interaction has historically been mostly in research. Um, I don't think it's such a new thing really to look at how dogs look at computers, but I think it's much more of a newer thing to look at how we can design and build interactive computers, especially for dogs. Um, but they have been using technology for a long time. We get lots of different technology nowadays, such as GPS, uh, college trackers, we get lots of wearables and movement trackers, such as the Fitbark. Um, we get these bark to speech apps and things like this, facial recognition for dogs, tracking eye movement, other emotion detectors. And then especially for the consumer market, we have a lot more of this dog technology coming in that gives them things like treats or, you know, allows pet owners to remotely video or voice call into their dogs. And of course, technology is still widely used in research with dogs, such as with screens here you have on the bottom right, where they're looking at sort of facial recognition and dogs with screens. And then on the bottom left here, um, this one here is a really lovely piece of technology designed by Georgia Tech, where they looked at search and rescue dogs and how does a dog uh, alert when it's found someone that's looking for. So it does this through biting the vest. And so increasingly dogs are using technologies as all these examples show really through both in the workplace to support us, such as the search and rescue dogs, use at home, such as all this pet tech, and a lot about this research purpose, such as here, where they're doing facial recognition with screens to really help us learn more about them. Uh, but historically, a lot of these technology used with dogs is mostly screen based interfaces. It's very easy with screens to map this one to one challenge to where a dog touch on a screen is what it means. Um, and these have a very a long, long history in dog cognitive studies. But there's also a lot of new technologies that are being developed for dogs that really change, I would argue, the way that dogs use computers. Um, and because traditionally to use screens, dogs have to be trained to touch screens or use screens. And I think it's like a very humanistic way. However, dogs, the way they behave and the way that they interact ordinarily in the world is much different, right? It's much more tactile. They exhibit all these wonderful behaviors. They dig, they chew, they sniff. Uh, here they're playing with a balloon. They have all this wonderful foray of behaviors. And this is really where I see sort of the future of dog computer going, really with these technologies that fit into their behavior, that sort of fit into the way that they already interact with the world. And so what I try and do with my work and where I really see the future of dog tech going is really if we just sort of threw out sort of what we see as computers for humans to look like and really started again from the dog's perspective. Um, and it becomes this large question then of really what do computers look like that would uh, really react to how they behave in the world already? Uh, you know, what would they do with these computers and how can a dog really control a computer if you build it around their everyday behaviors. And so this is sort of the larger questions that I think like animal computing widely tackles um, that I'm that I try and tackle also through all this novel technology that I looked at. And why do I think this is an important really for the future of dog tech um, and I guess this is kind of like the key takeaways for this presentation. Um, my research and other research in the animal computer interaction field has really shown that making these sort of tailor made computers for animals so bespokely for their needs and what they require really offer things to animals which they don't normally have, such as autonomy over different aspects of their lives, they can control different things such as the light, the heat, the visual displays or various different aspects of their environment. And this choice and control in animal uh, welfare has been massively documented to improve an animal's lives and overall welfare indices. And so I really think if these computers are gonna be successful and really improve a dog's life, they also need to be safe, they need to be functional, they need to have some sort of meaning to the dog. And so I really think that by looking at how a dog can use computers and making these more functional and more fit into how they behave with the world, I think we can make computers that are, have better this user experience and more enjoyable for dogs over long term and that can really have a benefit towards their life. And this is really sort of my overall goal and where I see the future of dog computing going for now. And so to help make this more concrete, what I thought I would do is sort of go over like two key core aspects of my work that I mentioned in the beginning. So the first one 
is to look at sort of dogs and screens. So as I mentioned, dogs have been using screens for a long time in cognitive science and animal behavior research. Um, and actually, this is how I also got into making dog tech was I noticed that my dog was watching TV with me in the morning when we were drinking coffee or just relaxing. Um, and I started to think, wouldn't it be really cool if he could control the screen himself? And so I started to do some research into this and I found a lot of the ways that we track dogs with screens is we traditionally train them to rest their heads, which you see here, um, these sort of images. Um, or we, you know, get them in a, you need them in a very still position to do this very finite tracking. And I thought that a dog doesn't really have an option here of looking away and I don't really want to train my dog to use this technology. I very strongly believe that technology should not instead already uh, react to his normal behaviors. And so I started to think that then what would a screen look like for a dog if we're going to change this technology over? And so one way this could have been done is maybe through a TV remote, right? So we just, uh, here's one that was developed by WAG, a dog food company brand. So it might have grips for dog paws. And here you see it's like uh, this yellow and blue designed to fit in with a dog's vision. And in many ways, you could argue that this is made for a dog. But I don't think this is really, um, I, you would still have to train a dog to press these buttons. A dog doesn't really go around its life pressing buttons as it does in this. And so I think this is really just a computer for humans sort of sized up for a dog. And this is still very much a human idea of what a TV remote would look like. And so I thought, OK, how do I go back to recognizing his normal behaviors and how my dog would watch TV? You know, it's just through his gaze, um, but I didn't want to train him. So I thought maybe I start with the computer side of things and I look at how can we build uh, an image recognition algorithm that would recognize my dog watching the screen automatically. And so I tried some human ones. Um, you see here, the, usually these boxes are around things like your eyes and your mouth, and it didn't, wasn't able to recognize him at all. And so then what I did was I um, used MATLAB's box of features, bag of features even, to build like my own one here. And this was this very gross approximation, whether he was looking left, right, or straight. So this is my dog I did it on. And what I found was we can get these sort of high um, numbers, so we can we can get fairly accurate recognition, but it takes a long time. And if you think about the way that a dog's faces are, they're all such various different shapes, various different colors. And so it's extremely hard actually to track back in free form. And this was also back in 2014, as you see my paper on the bottom there, um, where there wasn't that much actually uh, out around tracking dogs as much as there is now. And so then what I did was I thought, okay, so we can track him looking like center, right, or left. And so I thought, okay, so what can we use this for? Because we can't get this finite detail. And then I thought, okay, maybe instead of tracking, we can just recognize when a dog's looking at the screen instead. And so what I did was I built this system that um, was, we, we built it so it was able to recognize sort of the dog looking between these three different screens and then we change the content around the different screens to see if the dogs would follow the content on the screens or whether they would just look at the same screen. So in essence, whether it, this would be something worth doing, you know, if we could dogs could have a prolonged gaze at the screen. Uh, and the end goal here was really just to see this, whether they could use this method to select from screens. I thought this would allow them more of this freedom and control. And what I did was I cycled, you see here, all these different videos and sort of 20 second iterations between these different cycles um, and to see if they had a favorite screen. And because I wanted to do this in a sort of a friendly way to animals, what I actually, well, to dogs, what I actually did was I just, just put the dog in the study room with me and or with their, you know, their owner. And I allowed the dogs to just behave however they wanted to behave. And what the main outcome was, was this, my method that I developed was successful at gathering data. We found that, you know, dogs tended to not have preference between the screens, but they had these very low attention times. Here you can see it's typically like under one second. Um, and this was only done on a few dogs. This was like more of a method study, so I can't like uh, apply this across to all dogs. Um, uh, what we also found was that they tend to actually spend most of the time watching nothing, so not watching any of the screens, indeed. 
And so this was kind of a nice contribution because if you had trained a dog to rest its head, you wouldn't necessarily have had this sort of outcome. And so it was really evidence to me that if we start looking at methods of dogs to use computers differently, um, then this can be effective and we can get very different results. And this also started to highlight that dogs don't typically look at screens for long periods of time. Um, and so we started to think about maybe I need to think about this a bit differently and how does a dog, you know, activate a screen. And so from this, I thought the next stage would be so the, the content was cycling automatically itself. And so I thought the next stage, because they didn't tend to have a preference, be able to follow content between screens, I thought this is not so good for dogs then to use this is a method. And so what I did after this um, was I thought, how can a dog control the screen themselves? So back to this original idea of it. And what I did was I built this system for dogs called Doggy Vision. And what it does is it recognizes when a dog is stood in front of the screen and then it will automatically play randomized. I did it just on randomized videos. This device was a little bit um, harder than what I necessarily thought to build. We have things like dogs do crazy zoomy runs, they wag their tail in front of all the sensors. And so there was lots of these small sort of problems that we face when I was trying to build all this dog tech. And the system would, uh, in essence, it would film whenever a dog was interacting with it and save this online and to, to like a sort of spreadsheet style. So then I could see exactly what the dog was doing. And what I did was I did this with two dogs in the end. I ended up putting this in two dogs' homes for two weeks. So I left the screen and they also had like sound as well as the videos off for two weeks. And then I turned it on for two weeks. So I sort of had this baseline of how their dogs typically use the space and then how it was affected by this sort of screen device. And what I ended up founding was this system worked and dogs, both of the dogs involved in the study did use the screen. But it didn't really seem that the dogs learned how to interact with the screen. So just by stepping close towards, it was like, I think about like 120 centimeters in front of the screen, this boundary box, um, because their behavior didn't really change much between the screen being on and the screen being off. Again, like my three screen study, I found that dogs typically use the system in these very short bursts. So typically they were under three seconds, all of their interactions. And so once again, this really tells us and highlights that how dogs interact with screens is very different. But it's still sort of a larger question of what does the future of dog screens look like? And so I started then to also look at how often dogs are paying attention to the screen with this data. Um, so I found that you see here like above 50%, it wasn't getting really above this on the best of days. And so then there's there's no real trend towards their looking behaviors. It sort of happened a bit randomly um, and it isn't really clear why dogs increased or decreased their looking behavior. It wasn't towards any video. It wasn't towards any sort of day. Um, and so it's still a sort of open question really of why do why do dogs look at screens? Um, what attracts the dogs towards the screen and sort of the future of screens in this? But overall, what we did learn from this study was we can build technology so a dog is able to activate the screen itself. Um, and we, I learned a lot really as a developer of computers for dogs here, um, such things, you know, I mentioned the wagging tail, the sensors at the body height, for instance, but, but um, I, made, I made the technology so that they wouldn't trigger when they slept in the space. Um, there was lots of different sort of optimizing um, things that was learned from this study. Um, but I did find that this idea of proximity did work well, but there needs to be more structured learning to how a dog can figure this one out. And then when I started to think about this further, um, and this is sort of like a, the closing bit on screens, what I started to think about was maybe it's because I'm editing how the dog interacts with the screen, I'm editing singular or multiple screens, but maybe it's the screen itself. And this is really, I think, where the future of my work and screens will be going. Um, because a dog's vision is typically much wider. They have this like smaller focus area. And so then I started to think that maybe one screen isn't enough. And I'm still thinking in this humanized way of this, um, where we just have a singular screen with humans. We don't tend to, and we have like more now AR and VR immersive events, but I don't really want to strap anything onto my dog. And so I think the future of screens is really something that is, looks very different from the screens that we're seeing at the moment.
And so then I'll move on to like the second sort of topic that I'm interested in, as well as this sort of screen technology for dogs is really sort of how can dogs use the internet. Um, and I got really interested into this technology because I was building all these screen technologies for my dog and I was, you know, doing a lot of these um, sort of novel programs that I never published and I would just write about on my blog all of this like dog tech and where I can do these different things. And um, I then got a job in Helsinki, so I was in England and I sort of moved across to Finland. And I thought, oh, you know, whenever I was ringing my dad, my dog was going a little bit crazy. He purrs a little bit like a cat. And I started to think, wouldn't it be wonderful if the same way that I miss my family and I was ringing my family, if somehow the dogs could connect over the internet. And so um, this is also very relevant. It became more relevant because I moved into Helsinki in 2017, 18. Um, as we had, we've had during COVID lockdowns, many dogs now, you know, are left alone for long periods and not typically being alone for long periods. And so I think really here the internet has a lot that it could offer dogs in, and in the same way that it's been sort of scaled up, it started out in very specialist for humans. And then we've increasingly got it into it's now ubiquitous, you know, inside everything we do. I think the same thing that could be happened for dogs. And so no one had really looked at sort of at this point, what two animal, what two dogs interacting over the internet would look like. So I started to write papers about this and sort of speculate on the future of this dog internet. So we used um, sort of very much drawing and very much like blue sky thinking. And so we had things like uh, this one over here is where a dog is running on a treadmill with its friend because dogs use so much of these referential gazes. Um, when running so they could run inside the home and still run with a friend. And um, we had one like here where um, do one dog, the, they had two balls and they were connected inside the home. And so when one dog threw a ball, it would throw the ball in the other home. So it allowed them to sort of play remote fetch almost with each other. We had another one here that was a bit more lighthearted where two dogs are sat at home and they both decide they want to meet up. So a laser comes on their collar and then it points them both towards a local dog bar, which has like a gate inside that only lets friendly dogs or dogs that get on on the inside. So it allows dogs to remotely meet up. And then we have another one here where they had um, these sort of tug of war rope style toys. And they would recognize um, how each dog played with this tug of war and sort of do mimic the style back. So you could have this sort of big, huge virtual tug of war between multiple dogs. And so you can see we sort of started imagining the internet and in very much already how a dog behaves with the world and how this could really fit in with them, what I mentioned at the beginning. And we had these sort of like lovely discussions around it. And what we sort of found was sort of the, the key finding here was we were often repurposing current dog toys. So whether it was we had that balls or we had the, the rope interface. And this was because a lot of dogs already know how to use these interfaces and they already know what they're for. So in terms of their affordance and how a dog could use them, this would be something very easy to do. We often spoke about a lot of recognition behavior. So using machine learning to automatically recognize a dog was um, doing something such as they, some people will recognize they wanted tail wags for liking things or, you know, um, drop a toy inside a basket to start the interaction and then recognize that the toy was there. And this was often spoke about a lot as well in this idea of choice. So that a dog has really a choice to take part in the, the technology interaction or not. So it's just not automatically sort of turned on. And and then we also weren't discussing these screens. I mean, discussing these designs. Um, we also spoke a long time talking about the fact that technology here is really a mediator um, between two dogs. And so there is really a need for both dogs in the interaction to somehow understand that they're both interacting with technology in some form. And we speak about this a lot in like uh, human computer interaction is in the gulfs of interaction and you know and what does it mean to understand technology. Um, and the, you can raise this sort of as a philosophy question, I guess, and you know how does a dog know a dog is playing with another dog. Um, you know they have this asynchronous interactions and how can we get a dog's intention of playing towards another dog. 
And I think Steve North summed this up very nice when he said all animals are on this sort of continuum of awareness and, you know, I believe that dogs are also possibly on this, but how do we know really what they understand when using an internet is such a large question here. And so I believe we can capture it in some sense, as in we can see what they're doing with internet devices. Um, but in this case, what a dog would expect to get from another dog in a computer system and its intentions of using another system is still very much unknown on how we would capture this. Especially when we think about it is the meaning and experience of what a dog ex uh, meaning and experience of what a dog has when using technology is very much through the human so either through the owner or dog behavior as acknowledgement so we have to um, recognize that we only behaviors that we see and that we can recognize as behaviors are ones that we are really noting down. And so I think the dog internet is still like a little bit of a way off, um, but it, this doesn't mean that I don't think it's totally not possible. And so what I did was I took a little bit of a step back in this because I had such these huge questions of how do we know a dog's intentions and how do we build something even that is for a dog's performances. And so what I started to do was I started to build this device for my dog, so Zach, um, that allowed him to video call me. So the very basic, so I guess, of what we use the internet for this video call. It would have been lovely to do like a smell device, but this technology just doesn't, doesn't exist or something more towards how they interact with the world. And what I did to build this was I originally started out with um, looking at how he uses the world, so we gave him like new toys, so this is the ball toy here he's he's a Labrador so he, he carries around toys and fetches toys a lot, this is him. Um, playing with a Winnie the Pooh he loves sticks and he chews sticks um, the problem is sticks sort of wear out over time so they're not so good to put technology in or augment in this way, or maybe this is kind of the point of it. Um, he tends to lick and groom all these toys that he has, um, such as this cuddly soft toys. So these aren't necessarily good because these have different behaviors for him. But these ball toys, he didn't doesn't chew balls. He actually just ends up carrying them around his house, well, our house. Um, and so I decided to look at then different sorts of balls. So I gave him like a tennis ball. He associated this way too much with fetch. Um, this sort of softer ball. Um, but he ended up mostly sort of using on him a sort of favorite toy was this softer ball. And so what I did was I started to build technology that would fit inside of this ball and I put it inside a tennis ball so it was chew proof, even though he wasn't really known for chewing. Um, but it enabled the ball to maintain its sort of squishy factors which and sort of shape which is you know part of the reason he originally chose the ball. And what this technology did was. Um, Anytime movement was detected, and we did a lot of testing and trials, so it was a significant enough movement, um, it would video call me. So we had another computer set up in my house, um, so it would video call me. And then when I video called him, he could also answer the video. like we need the video call ball to get uh, Elena back. Yeah, let's just, uh, let's see. Elena. Okay, let's see if we can, oh, we're right on a, right on a good moment. I'll get her to Can you hear me? Yeah, I don't know if my internet dropped off. Oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah, I just heard like someone say video call and I tried to answer and it like cut my internet. Um, I'll just go back to sharing my screen. Ah, oh, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we're right on a, on a really good moment. We're all wondering what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's great. So I used the system sort of with my dog over many months um, and uh, it was a video call. So it would call from the laptop, but the ball was a thing that would trigger the call. Um, and what I sort of found was he would ring me daily, sort of often at the same sort of time. I don't really know why this is. Um, you know, he could have just liked the ball, but equally, if he didn't like the videos, he could have just abandoned the ball altogether. 
Um, occasionally he did approach the screen. He did also bring me things every now and then, such as he had this like pink, pink puzzle feeder that you put like treats inside that he would often bring me. Um, and what happened actually was he started to ring me a lot uh, near the end of the study. And so often I was in sort of the underground, I was busy somewhere. And so I would just always try and answer the calls and then tell him that I was doing other things. And so at some point, because I thought, oh, he's, you know, we're just having the same conversations. I started to flip the camera around and I started to show him buskers on the street. I showed him my office. I showed him, uh, you know, all around sort of my friends, where I was, what I was eating. Um, and I noticed that in my opinion, that he had much more interest in these sorts of calls. Um, and so I thought this is like really some, maybe I've been a bit like centered that he just wants to call me and maybe this might be more about expanding his world out there. And so why this work was really a case study in itself is in, you know, I built this really for my dog to be able to use. Um, this findings really have usage across different areas. And I think what we ended up finding was that dogs do use technology differently from day to day in this. Um, and again, we don't really know what a dog's intention was around this. Um, we demoed the technology to him initially. So, so I had someone in my house demo the ball and saw that it rang me a couple of times. But I think this wasn't enough really to establish a connection that this ball was necessarily interactive. And I think this is possibly one of the hardest steps, I would say, in making uh, interfaces for animals is really in finding something that they understand how to use, but then not making it so much like their current environment that it's a differentiation across. Um, and so it's this sort of battle and balancing, I guess. And I think also that um, sometimes I would call these interactions he had with me accidental because he would like nudge it with his butt or he would um, lie on top of it or he would just be running around the house with the ball. What I started to realize after the study was maybe this is just how he wishes to use video call interface, right? Um, and it, we really don't know how animals intend to use computers. So we have to really remain open-minded here and as to what we define as intention with animals is what we define as interaction looks like and really how animals are going to behave with internet devices. Because he arguably he could have totally avoided this device altogether. Um, and so I think that perhaps maybe new terminology is here needed when we talk about the animal internet really beyond what we see as this humanistic world and humanistic expectations. And also part of this process was really exploring sort of how can, you know, these internet and uh, internet of things devices really support dogs and human relationships. So at the start, when I introduced this technology in the first call, he did do like a whining noise and um, I quickly shut off the technology, but then every call afterwards, he never did this in there. But actually towards the end of the technology usage and why the study actually stopped was um, he didn't ring me as he typically would. And I was like, oh, where, where is my dog? Um, is he okay? You know, this is such a typical ordinary interaction. Um, and so this caused me some anxiety towards the end. And so there's a real need here that when we develop interspecies, you know, internet connected devices that we need to look at how do we balance this and how do we make sure that both of these users are okay. And so because I looked at a lot of designing technologies for dogs, I think one of the key challenges here is that we don't understand so much about how dogs use computers. And part of this process is really sort of this slow unraveling of all the requirements of what a dog needs. And part of this is also acknowledging that we are essentially humans building computers for other species. And so we might not know what they need. And while a lot of this technology is aimed to empower and give animals choices, this empowerment and choice implies in some way that an animal understands what they're doing or understands that what's going on in the technology. And it could be argued here that if they don't understand what's going on, then it's not really so empowering for them. And so I think we still need to heavily guard and sort of make space for animals being okay with the technology and sort of, um, here I did it so I was responsible for hanging up the video call, for instance, in case, as I mentioned, when he whined. But importantly, what I really wanted to highlight from this study 
is really that dogs can use computers differently and they can use the internet and they can control video systems, they can control these screen systems. Um, and that we are really on the precipice of looking at how can we design to, like uh, computer systems for dogs who have these very different cognitive and biological needs. And how do we rethink sort of the internet devices for dog animals? And I think here we're really forced to see, you know, dogs do use computer systems so differently and we should really start opening up into these new possibilities of really what the dog internet could look like when using internet systems. And so in summary, I've sort of given it there, but I really, my work and what I'm really interested in and where I see the future of all of this going is really these bespoke systems built for dogs that give them these different ideas of choice, these explore the different ideas of agency. Um, a lot of new methods will be needed, sort of how do we measure animals' interactions with computers and how do we do this in a friendly and compassionate way. And then I also am a strong believer that I think like the internet is coming uh, for all these animal devices. And I hope that this future technologies can really empower animals and that the internet in many ways can give us the same benefit um, to animals. So you can find out more about my work on sort of my website. So iliana.com. I also do a lot of tweeting or you're more than welcome to email me. Um, I also build systems for monkeys, so please don't get confused if, if you look at me up and find a lot of cute photos of sort of small monkeys. Um, but thank you so much for listening today. It, you know, it was a real pleasure to talk here and I'm thankful for being invited. And I'd love to answer sort of any questions you may have. Awesome, thank you so much, Athena. It's, I think um, we already have some questions in the queue, which is good because I'm not surprised because it was such a, interesting and and I think really um yeah thought-provoking talk especially because we're here to talk about you know the interspecies internet and so I think a lot of uh, questions and and thoughts come up so we already have Steve has a question so if you want to go ahead Steve let's let's start thank you you've made my day this is delightful work and uh I have to just applaud the immense amount of energy that you put into it uh, lots and lots of questions come to mind, but the, the, the one that um, comes to the top of mind is uh, one of the most expressive parts of a dog is the tail, and you only mentioned the tail in passing. Uh, has there been any work, have you or others done any work on trying to instrument the tail or give the dog the ability to express itself uh, using tail functions? And I have no idea what the history is. I'm sure there's a lot of history on how precise those actions are, whether they're measurable, whether they're repeatable, what, uh, you know, what the range of motion is and so forth. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I haven't looked at tail itself. Um, I know people that have looked at it as a form of sort of liking, so whether it, it likes this, um, but I, I wouldn't know the work itself. Yoram, I don't know if you know this work as well, because you're sort of in this sort of closest research field. Um, but I've seen it used, so that is in terms of user experience to measure the tail, but I haven't looked at it myself. Um, it's always very hard, right? Because I'm not sure if there's a unified agreement on, um, uh, is all tail wagging the same across species? Is all tail wagging the same across different spaces or different contexts or different cultures, right? And so you open up this huge, like I feel like always Pandora box when you look into all of this. But no, I haven't looked at it myself. Thank you for your question. Yoram, do you have any any thoughts on it? I mean, um, no, I have, uh, because I've been tangentially involved in the field, um, I have, but I haven't seen anything on um, um, sort of tail interactions. It's 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 I think it's actually quite uh, quite interesting because it's obviously a way of uh, of communication. But most of the um, most of the stuff that I've seen has either been screen based because it's a way to interact or various forms of tactility. So trying to get whatever animal it is, uh, touch and do something and using sort of facial recognition or movement recognition uh, to do so. I haven't seen anybody do anything with, um, with um, a sort of tail wagging or trying to interpret that. But that's that's um, an interesting uh, an interesting uh, an interesting point. 
I think it was Clara Mankini's PhD student who looked at tail wagging as a form of liking. Um, so I saw someone said tail wagging is pretty common across species. But from my like small knowledge about this, and feel free to correct me if you're wrong, if I'm wrong, um, it isn't always unified the same wag, right? They have like different um, sorts of things within that. Interesting. If anybody has any um, anything on that, we can put it in the Slack because I think that would be a very interesting uh, interesting thread to to follow up. Um, Con, did you want to ask a question? Yes, uh, I'm really interested. Does anybody have any information on the resolution ability of dog eyes with respect to screens? In other words, can they see fine scale? Um, differences in the screen, or are they more attracted to motion? And how does that relate to the uh, flicker resolution of the screen? So no one's looked at it in finite scale, right? So it's in like how small. I've not seen any papers look at how small. I know I've seen papers that look at a lot of um, dogs are able to recognize things on screens that have a high enough flicker rate, right? So these can't just be the older sorts of screens. Um, people have often contact me and ask what the dogs like to watch and I'm like oh you know this is like such a side uh, part of my work it's more about the technology side of things um, so dogs I know there's research on dogs able to recognize other dogs faces dog able to recognize human faces upside down um, and dogs able to recognize like if they're shown an image of the toy to go get a toy but I don't know to what granularity they're able to recognize and a lot of this is just taken from the biology of the eye what we think dogs can sort of recognize on screens beyond them being able to recognize these things. Bint, did you wanna? Sorry, I wasn't sure in which order uh, this was coming. Um, so this is fascinating. Uh, of course, uh, I'm always interested in anything that makes the internet more useful for uh, any uh, anyone, including dogs. Uh, one, uh, I put in the chat a question about Fluent Pet, which is a, a dog signaling system that we uh, discussed in earlier meetings. Dogs get to select buttons to push, and the owners can record uh, whatever sound that button produces. Uh, so that's how dogs can express themselves, uh, and apparently they learn which buttons, uh, you know, are I want to play, I want to food, I want to go out. Mm. Uh, a button could obviously uh, activate a screen uh, and make a call. Yeah, I could, but I don't see a dog's pressing a button ordinarily in their sort of everyday life. And so I'm really interested in moving beyond how we, we press buttons, right? We're trained to press buttons, we learn to press buttons, and sort of a new era of technology for humans are very much, you know, going off on normal everyday interactions. They root screens recognize, for instance, my iPhone when I look at it to unlock. Uh, we have all this lovely VR, AR technology that recognizes our normal everyday interactions. And so when I think about building technology for dogs, I think, okay, how can I build technology that fits in with their normal and everyday interactions and behaviors that really fit with them? And what I don't want to do is I also worry a lot about this training bias, right? So if we train an animal to do something, how do we ever really know it's doing it for other reasons? We get this clever hands approach. We, we, we enter into so many different forays here that how I've always wanted to build technology has always been from a dog's perspective as much as possible that I could get into. Well, uh, I'm going to make the argument that dogs are intelligent enough to learn how to do things and they do this on their own in many cases. So I'm not sure that I uh, reject the idea of the button pushing as mm. somehow weird. Uh, dogs can learn to do things, and they are using that to express uh, agency. So uh, I wouldn't reject that. And the fact that they could use this in order to make the calls that you've been um, recommending or trying out uh, seems like it's a good direction to test. So anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens. It looks like in the chat there are several paths in going in that direction. Yeah, I mean, if it works for some dogs and it, it brings them something in their life, then why not? But I just think the future of technology really needs to look very different. Mark. 
Great, thank you. This is fascinating. Um, and uh, I see all the conversation here about flu and pet and, and Vince's comments there uh, taken uh, to heart. The, uh, I, I'm curious, and, and I apologize, I've not been following your research or maybe you've covered this already, but I'm just wondering if you've um, shared any techniques or tools uh, that uh, would encourage other people to do the kind of, of uh, work that you're doing with, with animals and maybe do it in a, I don't know, kind of an open sharing collaborative kind of fashion. Uh, so to kind of, you know, crowdsource this effort a little bit. Uh, and uh, I'm especially intrigued by the notion of, you know, the, the, the multiple animals coming together and, and, I don't know, choosing to do something together, which, you know, I don't know this, you can be doing something together, but not know you're doing something together. So uh, <laughs> I'm not really quite sure how to how to tease that out, but but maybe through more experimentation with a lot more data collection, once again, that could be, you know, open and shared and, and accessible might be, uh, might be a, a good route to pursue. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think this would be super nice uh, in the future. I mean, I try and do all my software open access. I write blogs about how to use all this software, how to use my tech, um, you know, why I made these choices and code on why things that don't work. Um, but I guess this is such like um, a new thing in, in my mind to sort of really throw out everything and just start to build it again that I really hope that this sort of just grows and that more people look at this dog tech in a different way. But it would be wonderful to have this sort of collective around it. I totally agree. Yeah, maybe one day it could be merged with some open hardware movements. So we can also have, yeah, this development of different kinds of uh, tech for different dogs as well. Because I think one of this really great, great point that you made is that different dogs use technology differently. So this is also interesting to think about dogs as individuals as well. Um, Vince, yeah, there's also you... like a big argument that personality recently has mm. affected it. So people argue that, you know, how dogs use technology is also to do with the personality as well. So it'd be interesting to see that. Mm. So it's uh, it's been again. I'm um, just. Uh, have you got to the point where there's been another dog on the other side as opposed to a human? Not yet. No, I've not yet built that because I was just there's so many unknowns already that I didn't want to then just jump into something where I couldn't really have much takeaways from it. Right. I don't really like to use technology with dogs if there's no real meaning behind it or I can't see a very clear outcome um, behind this because. We inevitably always have this risk, right? That an, an animal won't like technology or it will, you know, cause some sort of anxiety or other issues. Um, and so I started really with, and I only published like back in November, this paper about sort of me and the dog video calling. And I'm now starting into the sort of research into sort of what do two animals look like on the internet and how can we facilitate this? Maybe it starts with dogs. I do lots of work with monkeys. Maybe it starts with monkeys, like who knows? Um, really where this has gone. So the, the chat is uh, is moving quickly towards uh, control, uh, using the pool and pet as a control device. Um, it seems to me that the dogs are really interesting because I don't know how they recognize each other. I mean, the breeds look so different. And yet when you take two dogs on a walk, you know, and they encounter each other, they're barking like crazy. Sometimes when it's, you know, yards, hundreds of, not maybe not hundreds, but you know, a hundred yards away or a hundred feet away. I don't understand how dogs recognize another dog. And I do wonder whether their reactions differ depending on whether it's a dog in a video versus a dog in real life. Mm -hmm. Because in a life case, there's a potential for um, uh, olfactory recognition as opposed to visual recognition. Although I'm really surprised that if a dog is a hundred feet away and they're both barking at each other. It's not clear whether they're barking because of an olfactory discovery or because of visual. And I don't know, you know. But it could also be something I like know it's a dog. <laughs> it could also be something beyond our recognition, right? I tried to touch upon this a little bit in the talk that we can only really recognize the way a dog is using the world in ways that we're able to recognize it, right? A dog could have a totally different sense than what we know, um, such as you know, with birds and infrared and all this was only recently discovered. Um, so I kind of try and keep like a, sorry, I live like right by a busy street. 
I try and keep like sort of a very open mind into how dogs can experience the world and really sort of start on this ground up of looking at how they can build technology um, from there. I mean, it's a really interesting, we get into like the bit of philosophical question, right? Of when they said like, you know, uh, I think it was um, Ludwig, right? Who said like, if a lion could speak, we wouldn't understand what he was saying, right? So if a dog could recognize another dog, would we understand what they would necessarily say to each other or what they would do to each other? So it becomes like a bit of a philosophy foray, I think, at times. Um, in the chat, we have a from, um, question or uh, also a statement from Sasha. I don't know if Sasha, you want to ask this question because I think it's really interesting kind of along the lines of what we were just discussing, discussing between the natural and unnatural dog behaviors. What is a learnt behavior and what is a behavior um, that is naturally occurring in, in dogs? Did you want to talk about this? Sure. So my, my robot vacuum was, I've shut it up though. So, <laughs> so I actually, I actually have two questions since I have you. Um, one of them was this idea, you know, I, I, you were speaking about the, the button pushing as being kind of an unnatural behavior. And I'm thinking well, about maybe like, we don't know what's natural, right? For dogs, dogs is sort of like a, like a subspecies. I meant ordinary behavior, right? We don't see dogs like ordinarily doing this. Yeah, so so I guess that that was kind of the basis of my question of sort of like, well, how do we know? I mean, dogs constantly develop because they're used to living with us for so, you know, living with us for so, so long. I guess that was kind of my question of like, well, how do we know what's ordinary and what's not ordinary as one of the things that seems to me, to my mind, ordinary, if you will, about dogs and, and lots of animals is their ability to adapt and be creative, I guess, about ways to communicate when they, you know, so like a dog that will, I had, I had a, a dog who would always sit across the coffee table between me and the TV when he wanted to go out. Why? Because I'm watching the TV and he knows he'll get my attention. Now, is that a natural, but you know, there's an ordinary behavior. Not all mm -hmm. dogs are something that is learned from the situation. And so to my mind, the buttons and I'll confess my dog has buttons so maybe I'm biased but but and and my dog picked up on it just watching me press it once I mean she pressed one within 30 seconds she's abnormal but but you know so so to my mind sort of like just the you know if the ordinary behavior is their ability to creatively learn I think it I guess to my mind it's sort of hard to tell what you know what is ordinary and what isn't so I guess I wonder your thoughts on that. But then my other question is about this idea of screen time. Like screen time is something that we're all so concerned. You know, people are concerned about screen time with children. We're concerned about our own screen time. We have these apps to prevent us from, you know, spending too much time on the screens. So I wonder if that's ever something that you've thought about in using screens as the basis. Is this something that maybe is a concern with screen time with other animals as well? Mm. So with what's ordinary, I agree, you get into like a huge, <laughs> huge, like down rabbit hole of like what's ordinary when we don't have a species that is like ex situ, in situ, right? Uh, well, maybe you have wild dogs as well, right? It gets into a totally crazy rabbit hole. And so when I when I use the term ordinary here, I'm meaning something that's like untrained, something that I see them doing a regular behavior of this. Um, and I guess because my whole background is in creating new technology, I'm super interested in how can new technology support dogs from this. Um, my dog doesn't use buttons. Um, I think it's typically dogs when they see a button wouldn't necessarily know how to use a button. And so I just wanted to build something really that fitted in with that everyday normal expressive behavior of things. And I understand that this is very flexible, right? And maybe if every dog starts using buttons, then this will become part of their ordinary behavior, right? And so it is this flexibility, I think, in there a little bit, but it's just not what I do. Um, and the screen time question, yeah, this was something that concerned me a little bit. Actually, more, it came up more in the video calls um, side of things, because he called me a lot, my dog, near, near the end of it. Um, and when I made the screen device for him, he didn't have any time limits on it actually so he could have watched it for a long time um, if he wanted to um, but he typically didn't and other dogs haven't done before um, but if I was going to develop something and all my technology reports um, 
basically whenever it has an interaction, it automatically reports this to me. So I can see if there's a huge amount of screen time happening. And if this happened, then I think I would stop putting limits on. I'm always pretty shocked that a lot of technology that we have for dogs in our home has no limits on. So you can effectively give it a treat feeder and just it can get like you get anxiety behaviors, you can get frustration behaviors with all these treat givers. And I've blocked about this for a long time about, you know, owners just giving dogs this technology, walking away, leaving it, and we don't know really what's happening and it can cause a lot of negative behaviors. And so all my technology is tested with all the animals before I leave it for these long periods to make sure that I don't have any of this negative reaction. And then I look at all the files online and check all the data as it goes along. It's because then if I think if I did see this huge amount of interaction, I would then start having to question, you know, how much is good for a dog? Are we seeing any negative anxious behaviors around this? Um, and it's the same with the work I do with monkeys. It's exactly the same. We just monitor the technology. We ask the keepers so or you know the, whoever looks after the animal I, I see animal okay here and this is why when i did the three train study the animals care was also in the room with them so they could actively monitor and make sure the animal's welfare was safe because above everything this is primarily what i'm concerned with that, that's that's really interesting just to i, I don't want to take up too much airspace but um, I'm just thinking, you know, so yeah, of course, you know, the, the pressing of a button, not something you would typically see, but I wonder how much we're parsing that out from say like pawing at someone mm -hmm. or something like that, you know, like how much is this just a, a behavior that's just being moved to something or digging at the ground or anyway. I, oh, it'd be lovely to have technology that recognize like when a dog dug a hole and then did something for it or something like this, you know, this would be excellent. I thought about this once before with balls because balls like to dig so much. Yeah, mm -hmm. this would be really nice. Very cool. Thank you so much for your answers. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Asha. Uh, Con, did you have another question? Oh, I think you're still muted. And this happens to me a lot. Sorry about that. <laughs> I found it fascinating that your dog liked to look at uh, your office and surroundings and various other things. And I wondered if you could uh, include in your experimental design something like a surround sound uh, vision uh, screen, which would give a large broad range of uh, visual stimuli to the dog, including you. And that if your dog lost interest in you, that the dog might perhaps uh, focus on something else going on and then come back to you and so on. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we, we've been having this discussion of smell versus vision. And from what I know of people who have looked at dog vision, dog vision isn't really that great. Uh, compared to smell, which is extraordinary. And, and so maybe if you give the dog some interesting visual stimuli that the dog might spend more time focused on what you're doing and listening to your voice at the same time. Just the thought. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this would be super interesting, right? We start thinking about like, uh, does a disembodied voice, what role does this play in here? Or, you know, the future of the, I really think that this dog phone really what it showed me was that maybe my dog would like a video caller into a sort of a more dog park into nature into the city and where would he like to video call what would he like to see which elements of me or not of me or maybe his friend or other friend do we include into this it's a super interesting sort of study you yeah, know thank you so much for your comment there's a question in the chat. In the interest of time, I think we should maybe you know wrap it up in the last few questions. But the chat is really taking off in <laughs> lots of different discussions. So I encourage all of you to head to the Slack and continue the discussion because I think there we can really also share some insights. But there's an interesting question we have, Jia Bao. I don't know if you're still with us and you want to ask the question yourself, or I'm happy to pose it. I don't know. I can't see you in the chat, so I might ask it for you, which is, um, do you have any techniques and tips on user research, in inverted commas, with animals beyond observation? Oh, yeah. So I think observation is very valuable, but I think it should also be backed up with quantitative data. 
um, such as timings of when they use things, how long they use things for, um, quantity of their behaviors. I, I always really advocate for people to get like experts involved um, to really sort of help give more perspective on the behavior as well. So not just like the, you know, the, the animals, carer, whoever they are, can give an perspective, a behaviorist can give a perspective. We can measure their interactions. We can form this um, against how long they use something for, how frequently as well they use something for. These are also two different things. So often I use a sort of mixture of all of these methods together to really try and get a rounded viewpoint. Awesome, that's great. So we have that um, also in the recording, which we will put onto the YouTube and we also upload it to um, into archive. If anybody's interested in, in checking those, we include the link on our website. So if you're interested to look again at the session or anything uh, or any of the other previous sessions that we've had, you're welcome to. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of wrap it up now and invite you to join our next lecture which um, we're very happy that Jennifer Mather, who is also here with us uh, today, will be sharing her insights around some of her octopus research. So it's going to be very exciting. We will meet on the 30th of July, uh, so approximately one month from now at the same time. So we will send out a registration uh, quite soon so everybody can jump on and register. And of course, that also goes through our newsletter. So if you don't receive a newsletter, please um, get in touch and we will also give you uh, the sign up for that. And of course, see you on the Slack. Uh, thank you, Mark, for sharing that on the chat. That's where the conversation kind of continues. So we've had some really great conversation today and also we'll see if we can get the chat out to you all as well. So um, yeah. I think this has been a fantastic session and thank you, Eliana. I think this has been an amazing uh, way to, you know, really get into the, de the depths of what's happening in terms of how we, we engage dogs through their own sensory um, yeah, uh, behaviours. So thank you very much. And of course, get in touch with, with us or um, also join our next, next session. So thanks for joining us yeah, and enjoy for having me for the lovely questions. Everyone has been really wonderful talking about something that I just super loved. So. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone.